Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Ed Gemmel, Managing Director of Scientists Warning Europe, and I'm here to interview a very special guest, Sir David King, a Chief Scientific Advisor to the UK Government between 2000 and 2007, UK Climate Envoy between 2007 and 2013, and currently Chairman of the Centre for Climate Repair. Uh, good morning, Sir David. Thank you for joining me. Good morning, Ed. Um, looking back over COP26 now, in your view, did COP26 deliver? And most specifically, can our children now sleep soundly in their beds knowing that the leaders of the world are keeping them safe? I think the answer, the answer is a mixed one. So, for example, COP21 was the big decision-making process with 195 nations agreeing, if at all possible, to stay below 1.5 degrees above the pre-industrial level. This meeting was intended to dot the I's and cross the T's on that agreement. Now, I don't want to suggest by any means that this is an, a, a poor advance made because the, the advances made in terms of adaptation, mitigation and finance were all strengthened in COP26 and particularly, and this is important, the rules on carbon markets uh, have now been fully approved and they are absolutely clear. Uh, I think, however, that I would say, uh, oh, and I have to also say biodiversity for the first time had a, a full agreement. Uh, the, the nature of the agreement was we agree to protect, conserve and restore natural systems and the global ecosystems. So what, what we see is uh, several relatively minor steps forward, and I'll explain why I'm describing them as relatively minor. There was no real understanding of the extreme nature of the crisis. The word crisis was generally accepted, so that is already a step forward. But the extreme nature of the crisis barely appeared in the negotiations. So I think that the uh, development of causality around what has happened in the Arctic Circle region wasn't even a subject of discussion. And this is because that causality is a relatively recent discovery. The, the, what I'm referring to is the fact that the Arctic Circle the ocean, the Arctic Ocean, is now 50% exposed to sunlight during the three months of the polar summer. And the result of this has been the extreme weather events around the whole of the Northern Hemisphere, uh, driven by the enormous changes up there. The North, the North Pole is now one of the warmest regions of the Northern Hemisphere during those three months. Imagine what that is doing to the global climate system. So this has all now been set out in some detail by the Climate Crisis Advisory Group that I chair, and we publish our reports uh, in real time. So I think what we actually need is a re-understanding of not just deep and rapid emissions reduction, we have got too much in the way of greenhouse gases up there already because of what's happened in the Arctic Circle region. So we need to pull the stuff out of the atmosphere. There was no discussion of this at all. So we, however, one little point of hope. It turns out that they decided the next meeting, not in five years time, but the next meeting next year in Egypt at this time, will take new commitments from countries around the world. So we're pushing every country to make new commitments to manage the nature of the crisis. So I think there is an opportunity to put on the agenda for the meeting in Cairo next year, all of the challenges that are facing us and then a coherent strategy to manage them going forward so that we have a manageable planet for humanity into the future. Great. Now, focusing on one of those details, and you mentioned at the beginning the 1.5 degrees, the media is consistently focusing on 1.5 degrees, suggesting that that's the, the fairy tale line that will be completely safe so long as we stay under it. And is it true? Are we completely safe if we stay under it? And not only that, what are we going to have to do now to stay under 1.5 degrees? So the first thing is, if we had deep and rapid emissions reduction tomorrow, so as to achieve close to net zero, we would still be facing 
a short-term future for humanity. And the reason I say this is, and the IPCC fully agrees with this statement I'm making now in their AR6 report published in August this year, ice on land is now melting irreversibly around the planet. Whether we're looking at the Arctic Circle region or the Himalayas or Antarctica, etc. Now, if all of the ice on Greenland in the Arctic Circle melts, sea levels will rise by 7.5 meters, 23 feet. Who would believe that we wouldn't completely upset the global economic system well before we get to even a meter or two sea level rise? So if I, if I look at that statement, ice on land is now melting irreversibly. This includes the permafrost uh, in the regions around the Arctic Ocean, which is surrounded by land. The permafrost contains a vast amount of methane. And if all of that methane is released into the atmosphere, which will happen as the permafrost melts, and they're saying this is irreversible, temperatures would rise not by 1.5 degrees centigrade, but 20 degrees centigrade. Now, this may take a few hundred years, but it does mean while we're used to looking back in our civilization's history three, four thousand years, there's no possibility of looking forward more than a hundred years or so, a couple of hundred years. So I think the challenge is enormous and we need a fully fledged strategy to manage a manageable future for humanity. OK, digging just slightly into to what you just said and looking at the potential methane release, maybe we can go into that in slightly more detail now. So we're talking about the, the ice shelves, and the permafrost. We're talking about the methane currently trapped in there being released. Um, over what sort of period could we see the first jumps in, in temperature rise? Are we talking a decade from now, 50 years from now? And how quickly could it happen once the tipping point's gone? Most people in COP26 were talking about greenhouse gas levels today being at 415 parts per million. And many, many of our newspapers are reporting that. This doesn't count for methane. Methane, Ed, is already at taking us over 500 parts per million. And the rise in methane has happened very, very suddenly over the last 30 or 40 years. What we see is methane emissions from leakage from oil, gas and coal recovery. And that, of course, has been happening for a long time. Add to that increased methane emissions from livestock and rice farming to meet the demands of the new global middle class around the world. Very welcome but it's a big increase in methane production. And then we have leakage already occurring, explosive release of methane already occurring in the permafrost region, particularly of Northern Siberia. These explosions began in 2014 and have increased in frequency. More than a thousand of these craters left behind measuring 50 meters diameter, 60 meters deep have now been formed as pockmarked uh, region of Siberia. So what, what I guess we're seeing is new sources of methane appearing and the rate of methane increase year on year is going up. So we haven't yet focused on how we manage the methane problem, except the United States uh, president did make a commitment to massively reduce methane emissions from the United States landmass. Of course, we need similar commitments from every country in the world. But roughly 50% of the climate change happening today is due to methane. Right. Well, OK. Well, I mean, when we look back as well on what the IPCC was showing in its report and carbon brief went over the scenario, it was all based on carbon emission scenarios in the IPCC AR6 report. And within those various scenarios, it was likely that we went for the midpoint of those scenarios suggested we go past 1.5 degrees 2027 to 2035. So I think, is that likely that that is the timing we're going to go past it? And this methane release you're suggesting is already happening. So what's the level of increase that we're going to see when we go past 1.5 degrees and go towards two? I think there's a question that is very difficult to answer because we don't know what the rate of methane release it will be, just as it's rather difficult to say what the rate of ice loss into the oceans and hence sea level rise will be in fine detail going forward in time. 
But on, uh, let me come back to the question of the, the methane and its impact on r rising temperatures. Rising sea levels is a massive challenge. If we look at, for example, Southeast Asia, the latest analysis of the impact of rising sea levels coupled with storms in that region of the uh, world, there's a large number of massive storms, cyclones, hurricanes, etc. The country of Vietnam will be 90% under seawater in 30 years time under current levels of, of increase of sea levels and increased intensity of the hurricanes because hurricanes pick up their energy from the surface temperature of the ocean. When a hurricane has gone past, the ocean is 10 degrees colder behind the hurricane. That's where all the energy is coming from. And so as we add temperature, to the surface of the ocean, the hurricanes are becoming more intense. So what we're seeing is the rice producing countries, Indonesia, Vietnam, for example, amongst the top three rice producing areas of the world, won't be producing rice once they've been flooded with seawater, once. Right? So you, you salinate the, the land mass and it's no longer viable to grow mass, masses of rice. So I think the challenge on food production, sea level rise, we're looking at potential, even by mid-century, of over 100 million climate refugees from Southeast Asia alone. And I'm counting Bangladesh in there, which is not exactly Southeast Asia. But you, you're looking at levels of migration we've never seen before. And we all know how migration has already destabilized much of the countries around Europe and Britain. So I think going forward in time, we have to begin to manage to refreeze the Arctic. We, that sounds uh, preposterous to even think about it, but this is what we're working on here in uh, the University of Cambridge with others around the world. And we also need to learn how to remove greenhouse gases at scale from the atmosphere. These two angles are critically important. The first, the refreezing of the Arctic to buy time while we remove greenhouse gases and bring the total level in the atmosphere down to a manageable level. And as we go forward in time, of course, deep and rapid emissions reduction almost goes without saying. Following straight on from that then, so deep emissions reductions, um, and knowing that effectively 80% of the world's emissions come from the G20. Um, if we were looking at what can Britain be doing, Britain, Britain's government, Britain as a country, um, what would your suggestions be for that? And I, I will then come on afterwards, but um, after this question, to look at maybe what we can do at a more granular level, just for the last one or two minutes of this interview. So one minute on where should Britain be going? What should we be trying to do? Britain has been in the global lead on actions on climate change, and I know that's difficult to understand, but uh, in many ways, we were the first country in the world, 2008, to have all party agreement on a, a, a new plan, which is developed through a climate change committee of parliament, establishing four yearly into the future uh, commitments to carbon dioxide emissions reduction. And that goes forward to 2035 when we should have reduced our emissions by 78 percent so we we are well on that road however the present government quite frankly has has made very clear statements at prime minister level without any clear actions to deliver that this wasn't even mentioned in the most recent budget climate change was not mentioned so Britain has to focus on delivering on the promise made by Prime Minister uh, uh, Johnson at the G7 when he made that commitment to uh, a, a, re a reduction of 75% by 2035. Right, and that's moving one slight level down, business leaders. When we're looking at, at leaders of major companies, particularly international companies such as Unilever and others like that, what would you be saying to those business leaders on when they where they can step in and help? I think this is a critically important question. We need to understand that the Industrial Revolution was a major global transition in economies spreading from the UK and outwards around the world. And it was all based on fossil fuel burning to create the energy for that process. 
energy is the biggest single industry in the world. And as we transition away from fossil fuel towards new technologies, every bit of that process is a wealth creating opportunity. So what the business community needs to understand is don't invest in futures that involve fossil fuels because that is throwing money away. You're not investing in something that will give you a return. Invest in this exciting new opportunity given by the transition away from fossil fuels and your company will do well. Companies like Unilever are said to be in the lead. We all think they need to do more. DSM in, in the Netherlands is probably the leading country in the world on greening itself. But I think we need to get this message across to the oil companies as well. If you want to stay in business, use your level, uh, your, your ability to gain finance to make this transition and lead the way forward. So I think the, the opportunities need to be stressed to the business community. Quite honestly, I was excited by the meetings occurring at COP26, the financial community who all seem to understand this, uh, the banking community very well represented there. And of course, I was also very excited by many of the businesses beginning to understand just how important being with this transition is for their future. OK, and that's just a last thought then. And we're at Scientists Warning Europe, often trying to encourage scientists to get involved at all levels of communities, um, et cetera, to try and drive forward change. Would you have any thoughts on what scientists should be doing to help drive this forward? I mean, and that's all. So coming scientists in their local communities and then some messages through to sort of more local communities and individuals. It's very important for scientists to understand, and I mean right across the board, the nature of this global challenge. There has never been a challenge like this in the period of our civilization before, where every one of us is responsible for the future direction and scientists have a particular role to play. What I think is critically important is for scientists to understand that communicating their work into the public domain is a critical part of the process. I had to learn this when I became chief scientific advisor. Instead of just publishing outstanding papers in uh, wonderful journals and getting high citations and serving my ego, suddenly I was in a position of translating this to policy makers to make advances. Now that, that requires a rethinking of your position in society, which is a communicator. You need to communicate not only with politicians, with, with young children. We need to communicate with future business people and current business people. So communication is a key part of that scientific endeavor. And I do think once you start communicating your science, it also influences what you are doing. Right. So I think there are some areas of science that are perhaps fully mined out, but you can still make tiny steps forward. I would say step back from that and look at what the world needs today. Great. And I, I was talking as well a little bit about communities and what communities might do. And this really is the, the sort of last question. Um, and we issued and you were a signatory. Thank you very much for a letter that we wrote to Prime Minister Boris Johnson and Maria Draghi pre-COP. Um, asking for more action, more leadership, and looking at targets closer to 2030 for net zero rather than 2050. But in Britain, as a good example, most of our major cities, so London, Glasgow, Edinburgh, Birmingham, and others, have taken 2030 targets for their whole cities, and that's run all the way down through counties and down to parish councils. So there are communities that are taking action and getting us on the right target. Um, do you see that as a vital way forward? And what would your thoughts be for individuals getting involved in helping that? I think it is a vital way forward, Ed. I think that if, if every city of the country is focused on that 2030 target, why wouldn't the government follow through yep. and, and lead from the top? I think that's a critically, a critically important part of this. In, in terms of individuals, and this would take much longer for me to give an answer than I have time for, Absolutely. I think each one of us is, is in a different position in society. 
you know, if, if whatever your job, whatever you're doing, you have a role to play in this process. And by, by saying that, I mean, for example, and I, I'm, I don't want to be unpopular with the farmers who are herding animals around because, frankly, cattle play, play a critically important part in development in Africa, for example. But if you're a big beef eater, remember that the demand for beef is, is getting us to lose the forests of the Amazon. The biggest beef producer in the world is Brazil, and every time we, we go forward and eat more beef, we are taking forests out. And of course, these animals produce a lot of methane. Again, there I've mentioned livestock as a big source of methane. So in our everyday behavior, we just need to remember that each of us has a, an impact, both in terms of what we do. If you're driving your children to school in a, in a diesel driven SUV, please think again. There's, a, there, there's another way of getting your children to school in a much smaller vehicle or perhaps on public transport. You know, there, there, there are other avenues forward uh, instead of trium triumphantly driving down in a very large vehicle, which really burns up the planet. So I think individual behavior is important, but for many people, targeting the community at large becomes critically important. Great. So David, fantastic. Thank you very much. Insightful, decisive, and as always, showing us the way that we need to go forward. So thank you very, very much. And thank you for everybody at Scientist Morning Europe. Thanks very much. Thank Bye -bye. you very much, Ed. Go well.